All right. Thank you, everyone, for the music. Appreciate it. Very well done, as always. Well, if you brought your Bibles, let's turn in them to our passage this evening, which is picking up right where we left off last week. So that will be Mark chapter 13. Mark 13, and we'll be looking at verse 24 through 37. And so we'll pick up right where we left off last time. And this is Things to Come, part 3. So in the sermon itself entitled Things to Come, part 3. So Mark 13, 24 through 37. And so this is the third study in Mark's gospel on what we call, I have up there on the screen, uh, the Olivet Discourse, uh, the Olivet Discourse as recorded in Mark's Gospel. Now, so far, Jesus has warned us not to be deceived and to be on our guard. That would be representative of the first two messages, the first two parts. Well, tonight, Jesus is going to tell us that, need, that we need to be watchful. So you have what we've looked at so far. He warns us about not being deceived the need to be on guard. But tonight he's going to talk about being watchful. Now, I will tell you that one of the particular sections of the passage, which we'll talk about in just a moment, is one of the ones that I really appreciate in the account here in the Olivet Discourse. Because while being watchful, we are supposed to serve the Lord. Because quite frankly, we don't know when he is going to come. We don't know what tomorrow holds. Perhaps he will, perhaps he won't. And we are about, we are to be about the Lord's business while we wait. Uh, there is, of course, the extreme take, which is, well, Jesus could come back at any time, so I just sit in the pew and get sour, because he could come back any time. What's the point of doing anything? The other side of the pendulum gets obsessed with it. And, of course, then, of course, the other is one just ignores it and says, well, nobody knows, so we can't figure it out. It'll all pan out in the end. And then there's no, if you will, teaching of it in the church where the truth is actually in the middle. We are to serve the Lord in light of his return because we don't know when he's going to ever come back. Could be today, could be tomorrow, it may not be in our lifetime. But imagine if he caught you not today but on Thursday. Or Friday, how would he catch you? And if Jesus' return is unknown, we need to be busy about the Father's work because night is coming and there will be no more work. So a better approach to it is what Jesus will teach us later. Perhaps, but perhaps not. So the outline is pretty simple. In the discourse in Mark, he concludes with, a few verses, 24 through 27, on the return of Jesus. So he's going to pick up at the end of the tribulation and focus on the return of Jesus. And we'll see a few characteristics of what it will be like. But then Jesus, as I like to say, the most brilliant, astute of all teachers, teaches two parables, and these are two of his, what I just call uh, five end times parables. Usually when we think of the parables of Jesus, we think of the sower and so forth. But these are two that are what I call end times parables. The first one is the one of the fig tree, which is 28 through 32. And then one that's unique to Mark, you'll find it nowhere else, which is the parable of the doorkeeper. Uh, I actually think if I were going to name it and nobody asked me, I would call it the parable of serving while we wait. And that is what Jesus wants to end it on. He doesn't want to end it on speculation, but brilliantly describes the need for a servant of the Lord to serve in light of his return, because we don't know when it will be. So we'll touch on that in a few moments. Now, we're going to read this in sections, honestly, because of their parables. Otherwise, we would just read through the whole thing. But let's read verses 24 through 27. This concludes... Technically, the discourse in terms of what he's teaching. Uh, and then we'll look at what we've covered along with this, which speaks of the second coming. And then we'll look at the parables themselves as Jesus concludes what we have in Mark. So let's just read 24 through 27, picking up from last week uh, where we left off in verse 23. But in those days after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. And the stars will be falling from heaven, 
and the powers that are in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send forth the angels and will gather together his elect from the four winds, from the farthest end of the earth to the farthest end of heaven. If you've been with us for any time, you know where we are. We are in the last week, last week air quotes, of Jesus' ministry. This is the servant's suffering. The servant's suffering starts in chapter 11, verse 1. An easy way to remember Mark is everything leads up to chapter 11, verse 1, and then everything changes and goes into that latter week. The latter week, of course, begins with the triumphal entry, uh, and it ends with, of course, the crucifixion and such. So this is the time period we're in. We're probably on Tuesday. Uh, I take the discourse to be taught on Tuesday. Why is that? Because you're running out of days. <laughs> Quite honestly, it, you can't have it on Thursday. And so I think the best way to teach it is it's Tuesday. That's the best way to teach it. Now, if you remember the last time and really the last few times, the setting of this picks up from Mark 12. Mark 12, if you remember, ends with the widow's might. Jesus is in the temple and he's observing in the women's court the treasury. You have the widow's might. And then they immediately, they, the disciples and Jesus, leave the temple. And the disciples are marveled at the temple. They, they just cannot get over the grandeur of the temple. And rightfully so, as we saw. It is quite a miraculous, if you will, extension that Herod the Great had. And so they marvel at it, but Jesus sort of says, why are you marveling at this? It's not going to be around forever. In fact, it's going to be destroyed. And we know that the temple we've already seen was destroyed. Historically, we can go back and see where Titus the Roman destroyed it in 70 A.D. The disciples, in fairness, in their minds, I keep repeating this, in order to understand the discourse, you must understand the third point. Otherwise, you begin to come up with some squirrely stuff. The disciples, in fairness, are thinking when the temple is destroyed, God's judgment has come, and he's going to thus then establish what we would think of as the kingdom on earth, the millennial kingdom. How do we know this? Because even after the resurrection, the disciples ask the same question. Acts chapter 1, verse 6. Okay, now is the time, right? Now you're going to establish the kingdom. And Jesus doesn't say no, does he? No, he says you must go and preach the gospel to the ends of the earth. Now's not the time. The time will be God's time, as we'll see in just a few minutes. So what is presupposing all of this is Jesus wants to, in a sense, clarify with the disciples, the temple's going to be destroyed, yet there's going to be many things that occur between the temple's destruction and, of course, the end. The end is always the second coming of Jesus. So on a line, and I'm trying to do this backwards, you have, the, you have the temple destroyed. There's going to be a lot of things until that second coming occurs. What are those things? Well, we don't have to guess. He says in the discourse that there will be, of course, misleading tendencies. And the disciples have a tendency to be misled. People have a tendency to be deceived. I've told you this, and I'm not trying to be ugly, and I'm really not. Christians are naive, and Jesus even has a parable on the naivete of Christians, and so he warns them not to be deceived. Don't be deceived that the end is coming, because there's going to be what? There's going to be a lot of false Christ. There will be etc. and so forth. Don't be caught off guard by these. The end is not yet. And then we know that Jesus comes to a specific point in time last week, there's no debate what the time period is. It's Mark 13, 14. And Jesus, as we saw last week, speaks of the abomination of desolation. That is the prophecy of Daniel. And we looked at that last week. And then Jesus wraps up with a few uh, final warnings that we looked at, which concludes up through verse 23. So now Jesus moves in this discourse, and if you just think of it logically, well, all he's saying is, yes, the temple's going to be destroyed. There's going to be this string of things that occur before I return and establish the kingdom. 
Jesus is focused on the second coming and the establishment of the kingdom. And you need to know that as well for these parables. Because otherwise, if you rip them out of context, you'll come up with some crazy teachings on those parables. And the parables aren't really that hard to understand. Now, you'll notice that there's no ambiguity of the time period that Jesus talks about. Notice verse 24, which obviously follows verse 23, which we saw last week. He says, but in those days. What days has he just been describing? And you don't have to guess. He has been describing from verse 14 through verse 23 the second half of the tribulation. And so Jesus says, but in those days, after what? After that period of time that I've just described, as the tribulation, something's going to happen. And what is that something? It's what we refer to as the second coming, the physical return of Jesus Christ. Now, I thought this might be helpful so we don't get mixing metaphors or get confused. What's the difference between the second coming and the rapture? Or is there? Well, the rapture is a later revelation and doesn't come into fruition until a later period of time. It is the return, in other words, Jesus comes and he gathers together his church. This was, in fact, a later revelation. So to read that into it is erroneous because that is not what Jesus is referring to. You'll see there the rapture refers to, for instance, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. That's where Jesus gathers together his bride. That's what the teaching of the rapture is. So someone who comes along and says, the Bible doesn't teach the rapture. Yes, it does. They may not agree with the timing of it, but it is. It's actually a word that is used in the Latin for harpazo in the Greek, which means to catch up and gather. And so that's what the rapture is. The second coming is what Jesus is talking about here, which is the literal physical return of Jesus, which was spoken of in the Old Testament as well. You'll notice the passage that I give up there is one example. Zechariah chapter 14, verses 4 through 11 say that in that day there'll be no mistake that Jesus is Lord. How do you know that there'll be no ambiguity? Because he's going to split the Mount of Olives in two when he lands. I mean, Congress won't be sitting around thinking, I wonder if that's Jesus or not. He's going to come and there'll be just no ambiguity to it. And so that is the second coming. That's the physical, literal return of Jesus to the Mount of Olives, the same very place that he ascends from. And if you look at Revelation 19, 11 through 16, what do you find? The Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with great power and great glory. And what does he do? He comes forth and he slays and he rules in righteousness forever. In other words, it sets the stage for what comes thereafter. Um, I want to read this to you. It comes from our church constitution, and I think it sums it up well. I know a while back uh, the board had asked you to read it. If you haven't finished reading it, I'm going to help you out a little bit. There's a little bit more here. And it does summarize this as well because I don't want you to get confused And uh, misread here because, again, the teaching of the rapture is a later revelation, uh, as we'll see, or you would see in 1 Thessalonians. But in any event, read, uh, follow along with me here, and then we'll move on. Quote, The scriptures reveal that when Jesus, the Lord Jesus, returns, it will be first to gather his church, which will rise to meet him in the air, and will return with him to the Father's house. Subsequent to that, he will return to the earth with his church and holy angels to establish his millennial kingdom. I like to think of it this way, if it helps. Jesus' first coming had a lot of events. There was a lot of things that were related to it. When we think of Jesus' first coming, what do you think of? Well, plurality of things, right? I mean, it's not just simply his birth. It is a whole array of things. And the second coming will be a similar type of thing as well. There are a lot of pieces associated with the second coming. And when we think of the second coming, we're thinking of Jesus literally returning. But there's a lot of events associated with it. And I ask you, is Jesus' first coming have any events associated with it? Uh, Yeah, a whole bunch. 
You think of John the Baptist had to come. So we have all of these events. And so this is what we end up with. Jesus raptures the church. He gathers his bride. At some point time after that, we have what we saw last week, which is the Antichrist is the starting of the tribulation. Uh, the clock resumes on the 70th week. And then it runs, and then you'll notice at the end what happens. Jesus returns, he literally returns, and he literally establishes his kingdom. And so that is what we are looking at here. Now, at any rate, let's go back to our passage here, and we get some characteristics of this second coming of Jesus. And I list a few of these here, and they're fairly obvious. First is there's a lot of what I call celestial disturbances. This is spoken of in Joel chapter 2, verse 10, for instance. So Joel chapter 2, verse 10, Revelation chapter 6 through 18, the whole thing is an array of celestial disturbances. And so we see that throughout the tribulation. There's not just one, but there's this array of events that happen. You'll notice Jesus makes another reference in verse 26 to the Son of Man coming in in clouds with power and great glory. That is a quote from Daniel. Jesus had an affinity for Daniel, meaning the book of, didn't he? We saw last week not only the 70th week, but Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, and here in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, the description is that the Messiah is to return, of course, in the same way. If you were to turn to Revelation 1-7, this is the exact same thing. The only difference is the people on earth mourn and are in great sorrow when Jesus comes back at his second coming. Why is that? Because their time is up and man's day ends. It is the time for Christ to rule in righteousness. Think of that for a minute. That will be the time when Jesus ends all of the shenanigans and unruliness of this world. Man will then have to be under complete subjection to Jesus Christ. No wonder they mourn. People today mourn and grieve because they do not want the Lord ruling and reigning over them. And in Revelation 1-7, the Apostle John records that the earth mourns at his return. Why is that? Again, man does not want God to rule, does he? They want to rule apart from God. And in that day, there will be no other name than Jesus Christ. Then you see as well, the third thing up there is he gathers his people, those who have believed during the tribulation. This is the, if you will, linchpin of what I saw mentioned last week. Remember the verse? You will be hated by all because of my name. How many would like to know that? That's one of the things that Jesus says. But he says, he who endures to the end will be what? He'll be saved. Sozo in the Greek. He'll be delivered. Those who believe during that period of time and live through the end will be delivered and enter into, if you will, the millennial kingdom. Now, I know the typical debate with eschatology is it has no bearing on this life. So there's no point to teach it. The two parables actually negate that argument, but this quote comes from R.A. Torrey, and he used to be the second president of the Moody Bible Institute. And I want you to just listen to this because it sets the stage for the two parables. Notice what he says. This he's referring in general just to Jesus' returning eschatology. He says that he was trans, that it transformed my whole idea of life. It broke the power of the world and its ambition over me and filled my life with the most radiant optimism, even under the most discouraging circumstances. Why? Because what we have on earth right now isn't the end. If all you had was what we have and it's this a perpetual nature, I mean, who would have any hope? I mean, I would be thinking to myself, what's the point? There is no hope. But if you notice here, what does eschatology really teach us? It teaches us that for the child of God, there is hope for the future, and it should impact the way we live. And that is exactly the two parables and what Jesus drives home. Now, notice in the verses 28 through 32, we have the first parable. 
and it's what's called the parable of the fig tree. Both of these are to teach the disciples and us a lesson because eschatology, I would be the first to tell you, one of the worst things that I ever couldn't encounter with is people who get obsessed with it and then they don't relate it to how it should live and affect the Christian life. And that is the opposite of what actually Jesus teaches. Notice these parables. This first one is the parable of the fig tree. Let's read the parable and then see what it has to say. This is verses 28 through 32. Now learn the parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. Even so, you too, when you see these things happening, recognize that he is near, right at the door. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But of that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. So Jesus teaches this parable, and as I said, if I were to say we're going to study Jesus' parables, you would have said you've already done that earlier in his ministry. Jesus has what I call five end times parables. Two of which are here, one is unique, and it's the last one. And I actually think it's the most brilliant one, and is the most applicable one, even for us today. But this is the first one, and it's the parable of the fig tree. If you want to read the other ones, just read Matthew 24, 25, and you'll find them. The parable of the fig tree is there, uh, as well as three other ones. But you'll notice here that he begins with, and he says it's a parable. What's a parable? Well, it's a parable, but what is a parable? Parable is, and I'll read you a definition, a figure of speech in which a moral or spiritual truth, notice, is illustrated by an analogy drawn from everyday experiences. So again, by very nature, it's an illustration, so don't go too far with the illustration is the point. Uh, I have seen people come up with some of the most crazy stuff with parables. But this one is actually fairly simple. He uses this fig tree, and you'll notice what Jesus uses, and it helps us understand that difficult verse about this generation. The fig tree is unusual. It's unlike the other ones. Do you notice what it does? It produces fruit and leaves, I underlined it for emphasis, about the same time. Not at the same time, but almost the same time. So most close to the same time that it is almost. It's about the same time. The idea that Jesus teaches here is when the leaves were present, you know that summer was almost there. It's right at the door. It's close. It's near. What is he saying? When you see these signs, know that, of course, my return is near. Notice it and let's read it again. Now learn from the fig tree, the parable is, he says that it, when it be, the leaves, be, the branch and so forth becomes tender, he says you know that summer's near. Notice verse 29, he applies this and he says, even so you too, when you see these things, what are the, these things? Well, the things he just described. The things that will be preceding his what? His second coming. When you see these things, what do you know? Well, verse 29, he is there. He's right at the door. He is close by. And so he uses the fig tree to say, when you see the leaves, you know the tree is about, the fruit is about to come. When you see the signs, you know that the second coming is about to occur. Now notice the verse 30 that people get all tied in a knot in, and I don't really understand. I mean, Jesus almost tells you, he's already told you what this means. But for argument's sake, I'll give you some of the interpretations. Now, you'll notice verse 30. Have you ever read this before and thought, well, how does this work? He says, truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until what? All these things that I just spoke about take place. So there's a lot of variance, but basically there's three general ways to take this. One is that this occurred in 70 A.D., you got a problem with that. Jesus didn't come back literally in 70 A.D., but then there's this other one, and it's the crux Achilles heel to that argument. Jesus said that these days that he described would never be that bad again. 70 A.D. was bad, but we've had two world wars. 
and they far eclipse that. So it makes it impossible to interpret it that way. So don't fall prey to someone who says this has already occurred. The other two are the other ones. Now, I think the principle of the second one is the K is true, but I don't believe the interpretation is correct. I think it's stretching at something that doesn't need to be stretched at because Jesus has already interpreted it for you. The second one is that the generation, and it can be translated this way in Greek, refers to the race, in other words, these Jews. And what it would say is the Jews as a nation or as a people would never be annihilated prior to the second coming. I think that's true. You can see that throughout history. Uh, What was Hitler's main modus operandi? Well, it was to destroy the Jews. Who's still around and who's dead? Well, we know. I think the principle is true, but I think you're stretching at it and you're not interpreting it correctly. Jesus has already told you what the generation is he's referring to. And I think my preference is the third one, which is when these things happen, these things, what are these things? The things that he just spoke about are the things with the tribulation. When those things start, that generation, that group of people will come and live to see them fulfilled. How do you know that? Because that's what the parable teaches. Uh, The parable is the Achilles heel to both of those because neither one of them can interpret it that way. The parable, what does the parable teach? When that generation that is alive sees the leaves, they're going to be around to see the fruit. When they see the signs of the tribulation and when this son of man, before the Son of Man comes, when they see the abomination of desolation, that generation is also going to see the parousia, the second coming of Jesus. That is the interpretation. It is not 70 A.D. It is not the race of the Jews. It is that those who were there in that time, when they see those things, they're going to see the fruit as well. And that is what it, I believe, is teaching. Now, more importantly, my favorite verse in Mark is actually 1331. Can't beat it. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Amen? What does that teach? It's called the indestructibility of the Word of God. It's a merism. It's, in other words, it's an expression. Jesus is teaching here that, look, all of creation could pass away, but my Word will remain and my Word will be fulfilled. How many... Things in this world can you guarantee? Other than the word of God, in a sense, that's it. That's what Jesus is saying. He says, as soon as I say something, my word can be trusted. Even if heaven and earth could pass away, my word would remain and I'd still fulfill my word. You can bank on one thing, and it's not what a politician tells you. It is what the word of God teaches you. Now, let's look at, real quick, Isaiah chapter 40 and see and test and see if this is true. Because I can tell you right now, I would not be up here. I would resign immediately if this statement isn't true. But it is. Isaiah chapter 40, and this is essentially what Jesus is teaching at. Because the whole crux of his argument is, if my word isn't true, you have nothing to hope in, you have nothing to believe in. But yet the opposite is true, too. If it is, you can rest assured that my word will be fulfilled, even if all of creation were to somehow be possibly destroyed. Isaiah chapter 40, verses 6 through 8. A voice calls out, and then he answered, What shall I call out? All flesh is like grass, and all of its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades. When the breath of the Lord blows upon it, surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God stands forever. Amen, amen, amen. God's word has been settled in heaven forever. But we got one more. And it's what's unique in Mark, and I think it really shows Jesus' not that we would expect anything different, brilliance. 
is brilliantly positioned here. It is, quite frankly, one of the most simple yet beautiful ones of them all. And it's called the parable of the doorkeeper, and nobody ever asked me, but if I could rename it, and I use this just in case you want to go back and study it, it would be what I would call the parable of serving while you're waiting. The tendency of eschatology, as I mentioned earlier, is to avoid it like the plague because nobody really knows. And that's really what you call lazy teaching of the word, just avoid it, avoid a fourth of it. Why would you avoid a fourth of what God has given to us? The other is to get so preoccupied, Jesus is coming back, I just might as well not work this week and serve for him. And Jesus biblically balances that with saying neither of those are true. The fact that I could come back this week means you better get up off your keister and get to work because when time comes, you don't want to be caught having no fruit for me. So it's the parable of the doorkeeper. It's really the parable of the porter. Let's read it, and then we'll finish. Take heed, keep on alert, for you do not know when the appointed time will come. It is like a man away on a journey who, upon leaving his house and putting his slaves in charge, assigning to each one his task, also commanded the doorkeeper to stay on the alert. Therefore, be on the alert, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, whether in the evening, at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or in the morning, in case he should come suddenly and find you asleep. What I say to you, I say to all, be on the alert. Now, you'll see in this parable, it's really the parable of the porter, and I'll explain that in a minute, what I mean by that. Um, But you'll see here that Jesus begins by saying to take heed because you don't know when the appointed time is. Why do you not know when the appointed time is? Because it's God's time. If you follow somebody that says, I know when Jesus is going to come back, stop following them. I don't even care if they give you a broad stroke and say, well, he's probably going to come back in the next 20 years. That is a scapegoat way of brushing up against this. No one knows, notice where Jesus left off last time in verse 32, except the Father. Now, how does that work with Jesus? That's Philippians 2. Jesus laid aside certain prerogatives, certain things. And, of course, at that time, Jesus would have been, of course, leaving that to the Father. But the main thing to see here is that the appointed time of Jesus' return is left to the Father alone, and no one knows. What does no one mean? No one But it's amazing. Christians will follow somebody that says, well, we nobody knows, but he'll probably be back in the next five years. That is just the same thing. You do not know. This is why Jesus ends with this parable, because man's desire is to know something that is only for God to know. Now look what he does, and he weaves this brilliant story And the story describes a man who goes on a journey. It's astute because how long has the man gone? She don't know. Absolutely genius. Why is that? Because he's God. And only God could craft a story like this. The man leaves on a journey and nobody knows how long. He didn't tell his servants because it's none of their business. And only he knows. And he'll return in his own jolly well good time. But then what happens? Well, he describes slaves. The master is rich and he has slaves. And what are the slaves to do? Work until he comes. But then he zeroes in on, and don't miss this, because I have heard some of the worst butcherings of this ever. What he does is he focuses on one type of servant. You notice? It's verse 34. He focuses in on what is called a doorkeeper. At that time, it's what's called a porter. A porter was unique because the porter had to be on guard all the time and the others didn't. I mean, think about it this way. It is so brilliantly designed because the person who cooks, they could cook in advance and go take a nap, right? You could prepare in advance. The porter couldn't. The porter had to be on guard all the time. You know why? Because he and he alone was responsible for letting the 
if you will, man return back and enter into his house. So the porter had to stay on guard all the time. That is why Jesus focuses on the doorkeeper, on the porter, because the porter alone had to remain what? Watchful. Why? Because he had no idea when the master was going to return and what would happen to him if he came back and he was asleep. He'd be like some of you about right now. He'd catch you off guard and you wouldn't be prepared. Extremely, beyond, superbly brilliant. What is Jesus saying? Don't follow anyone who tells you that they even know the general time period because they're wrong. I don't care who it is. I don't care if I ever get up, you need to get rid of me because there is no one who knows. It is the Father's prerogative to know. And we know that from the story. Why? Because the man doesn't tell. He just says, I'm going away and I'm coming back. And you'll never know. And then he says, you need to work while I wait. That is why I call the parable that. We are to serve while we wait. Because why? Night is coming. And the worst tragedy for a Christian, I believe, is to be caught at the rapture unaware and have nothing to give to him. Fruitless before the Lord Jesus Christ. That is why John calls it Don't be caught ashamed at his coming. Let me ask you, you know, last Thursday night, I could tell you what I was doing. I was eating at the buffet, the China buffet with you guys. But what were you doing? What were we doing on Friday night? What are you going to do? You understand that is what Jesus is trying to drive home. Because the tendency even of the church today is to either avoid eschatology or to get so preoccupied. They don't do what? They don't serve. You and I need to serve while we're waiting on Jesus to return. Jesus gives us a lot of information about it, doesn't he? But he doesn't tell us when. So what should we do? Well, we live like a porter, busy, serving, because we don't know when he's going to come back. Perhaps it's today, perhaps it's not. But imagine getting caught off guard and being fruitless for him at his coming. That is what John calls ashamed at his coming. And you'll notice Jesus just ends. He gives no other instruction. Why? Because you've got a task to do. And work to do, and you don't know when he's going to return. So Jesus has told us various things, but he's told you to be watchful, not to be dormant as you wait for his return. So we're supposed to serve while we wait, because quite frankly, we don't know what tomorrow is going to be. And I'll tell you, every week I prepare as though I'll never preach again, because it's very possible that I couldn't. The Lord could come in rapture today. My time may be up. And so what do we do? We serve while we wait. Perhaps, perhaps not. I'm going to end with this because it's one of my favorite poems, and I know it's a little crunched. Uh, The full version, if you want it, you can let me know. But basically it's this, and uh, I have a copy of it and always keep it with the Bible I teach from. Today, of course it's a question, perhaps, perhaps today, The Lord may come and catch away his ransomed church, his blood-bought bride, to take her place at his blessed side. When the dead and living saints shall share one trumpet summons to the air. Perhaps today, yes, he may come and call us to our heavenly home, that wondrous place beyond compare, which he in love doth now prepare. Our Father's house, how sweet, how blessed, to be forever at rest. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for today, and Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to come back this evening, and as Jesus spoke about his return, Lord, Lord, he warns us of the same very thing we just have this perpetual problem with, which is trying to determine when he will come, when we just simply don't. Lord, the parables teach us the need to serve while we wait. Because perhaps he will come, perhaps not. But even if he doesn't come, we don't know how long our life is here. You have our days numbered, we don't. And so we are supposed to serve while we wait. And we are supposed to be, if you will, analogous to the porter who is busy about the Lord's work, always being watchful, always knowing in the back of their mind, perhaps today.
and not wanting to be caught off guard. Lord, help us to not only not be caught off guard, but not to be ashamed it is coming. Because night is certainly coming one day and we'll never be able to serve you again. Help us to serve as though it's the last opportunity that we have. Father, again, we thank you for our time today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.